This is the Home Service Expert Podcast with Tommy Mello. Let's talk about bringing in some more money for your home service business. Welcome to the Home Service Expert, where each week, Tommy chats with world-class entrepreneurs and experts in various fields, like marketing, sales, hiring, and leadership, to find out what's really behind their success in business. Now, your host, the home service millionaire, Tommy Mello. This is Tommy Mello here. I'm the home service expert. I'm here with Randall D. Hart. He's the co-founder of Fast Easy Accounting in Lidwood, Washington, and a leading expert in outsourced contractors, bookkeeping services. He usually specializes in $10 million or less for different companies. Uh, he specializes in QuickBooks. He's been in the contract world for over 25 years. He was born and raised in a construction family. And I've already talked to him for a half hour before this started. And He's just a wealth of knowledge. He's got a lot of complex concepts that really make sense when it brings it down to the contracting world. And uh, Randall, I'm excited to have you on today. How's your day going? Tommy, it's great to be here. I really appreciate it. And I'll tell you what, my day is going so well. If I was any better, I'd be twins. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that uh, little anecdote. So, you know, you've been in the plumbing industry. You've done a lot of things. You have your own podcast called The Contractor Success Map. Tell me a little bit about your father got started in the business. He's a contractor. Tell me a little bit about that and kind of where you've been and where you're going here with what you're specializing in. Sure. Let me see if I can I'll try to get this condensed as much as I can. My stepfather, I actually was born in Oklahoma, and we moved up here in 1965 in, in the Seattle area. I married a guy who is just a, a really neat fellow. He's my stepfather, and he had a, a landscape and gardening business, which he started in 1949, and he retired in 1999, 50 years later. Now, it's kind of a funny situation there, Tommy, because I didn't know this growing up, but step-parents are supposed to be terrible people. My stepfather was the greatest guy on earth. He was just a real sweetheart. The thing was that having grown up in that environment, I got a different view of contractors. He had a lot of friends who were contractors and they were just wonderful, wonderful people. The fact is, I'll put this in there very gently, is uh, I always had food to eat, clothes to wear, and a place to live. But we were what would be, I guess you would refer to it as the lower middle income because it's just what his perception was. Perception is reality. And I, I enjoyed the construction and I got to develop what I, I called the four different kinds of contractors. There was a dog and pickup truck. And that's someone who literally had a dog. He had a cocker spaniel and a pickup truck. Second level of contractor was salt of the earth. And he had quite a few friends who were salt of the earth. And they would just you know, get together for picnics and barbecues and you know, uh, chats in the evenings and weekends. And he would, and he would all describe how they had between one and three employees. I hadn't asked one of the contractors, says, why three? Oh, that's simple, Randall. Because you can hold one by the throat in each hand and eyeball the third one. And I thought, well, <laughs> okay. And I, I got to look at my stepfather, and that's exactly what he did. Okay. Then over the course of time, I got to understand that there was something called a professional contractor. They had between four and 20 employees. A little different uh, thinking pattern. And then the fourth level contractors are enterprises, 20 people plus up. Now, what took place was. I, I really love my stepfather. He's a great guy. He's passed on, but he was just fantastic. I got out of uh, high school and I met my high school sweetheart in junior year and got married um, when we were 18, just already 45 years. She's the greatest person on earth. My, uh, God's gift to me. Anyway, I left high school, went to college, got my degree in accounting, university actually, had a lot of fun and spent a very short time in an accounting office to you know, become an accountant and, you know, step for the CPA exam, so on and so forth. And an interesting thing took place. I see that the universe has a sense of humor. And there was, a, there was a couple of people that would come in who were obviously contractors. They were big, burly men, a little rough around the edges. And I'm, I'm six foot, 275, so I'm in pretty good shape myself. But at the time, I was maybe six foot and 225. Any event, these guys were a little rough around the edges, and the other accountants would kind of cringe and I thought, oh, what the heck? So this one, I never forget this one particular plumbing contractor. He comes in with a Cadillac with mud to the gunnels. 
And he said, I need one of you blankety blanks. Every third word was, was a bad word. It didn't bother me. I'm, I'm accustomed to that. To, you know, take care of my bookkeeping and, and process payroll. And I said, I can take care of that. So I took care of it and I processed payroll. We had a lot of fun. A while later, a guy comes in. This is kind of funny. Guy comes in with a brand new pickup truck. I mean, it was gorgeous. And I couldn't afford that. And he was a home builder. And he needed some help with his accounting. So I did the accounting. He came back, picked up the reports later. This is all by hand, you know, pen and pencil years ago in the 70s. And he comes back, looks at reports, and he is just madder than heck. And he, uh, picture this. I'm like 25 in really good shape. And he's probably in his 50s. And he's a builder. And I got a little upset with him. He got a little upset with me. He said, you know, listen, punk, blah, blah, this. And if you were man enough, I'd take you out behind the, 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 the building here. It was a you know, small town. And behind the building was a parking lot. And I said, oh, man, I would like to do that. But I'd really hate to hurt you. Now, <laughs> now, Tommy, this is the 1970s. You would never in a million years do this today. We went out behind the, the, the building. And we kind of had a few... Uh, we, we threw a few punches. And I can tell you, I beat the crap out of that guy. <laughs> I, I banged on his fist with my face until it was bloody. <laughs> and then I turned around and I thumped the bottom of his number 12 shoe with my chest a number of times. <laughs> and then, because he just didn't seem to listen. So I pummeled his elbow with my, my stomach eight or nine times. And then I absolutely beat the crap out of the back of his hand with my left and right cheek. <laughs> and I got all done, we go back in the office, and I said, how is it that you are pretty good at street fighting? And, you know, I've been around the block. A wonderful thing, he said, listen, son, son, right? I'm not his dad, he's not my dad. Listen, son, old age and treachery will overcome youth and skill. I never forgot that. <laughs> I never again had any more difficulty with anybody. He had something prophetic. I mean, the universe has a sense of humor. He said, Randall, you've got to understand, there's two types of accounting. I don't understand it, but he said, there's regular accounting and there's construction accounting. He said, I'm a home builder, so I deal with what's called WIP, work in process. So he said, I take money out of the bank, I buy a piece of land. That's still an asset, but you're too stupid. You wouldn't know that. You thought it was an expense. I bring labor material, other costs and subcontractors to build a house, and it's an asset. It's called work in process. That was a game changer for me. All of a sudden, I realized there's something called construction accounting. And I got really interested in it, and I talked with one of the, the old guys in the office, and I said, this is great, construction accounting. He said, yeah, you might like that. He said, obviously, you're in shape for it, so that might be a good thing. I did some research, had a lot of fun, and then there was a, a big aha. There's a book written a long time ago. It was called uh, The Search of Excellence. They talk about the BFO. I had a blinding flash of the obvious. I came home. I told my wife. I said, Sherry, God, love you. you. You're wonderful. I'm going back in construction. And she says, oh, no, you're not. I said, oh, yes, I am. Because there's money there. You know how to do it. So I became a plumbing contractor. I became a, a German plumber and a plumbing contractor. And sure and I started several small businesses, you know, remodeled and handyman and everything. So we started a business, we build it up and we'd sell it. And we started a business, build it up and sell it. And we were using an accounting program at the time. I can't tell you the name of it because it's, it's not smart. Anyway, this is the 1980s, late 80s. And the program was $65,000. Base price was a DOS program. You paid 500 a month to get the key to keep it unlocked month over month. And in 1991, a program came out called QuickBooks. Oddly enough, it was like 100 bucks. That was a joke. I went ahead and bought a copy of it and gave it a try. And I ran dual books on two different workstations. And it was funny, Tommy, because the reports, the profit and loss and balance sheet, accounts receivable, accounts payable, and cash report, those five reports were the same on both systems, except that the QuickBooks system was a lot simpler and a lot easier to work with. And we switched over. I called the boys and girls up there for the program. I said, you guys are dead. You just don't know it because this thing called QuickBooks. And he kind of laughed and said, I don't think so. Well, they, they did fold up about five years later. Any events. So we've used QuickBooks since it first came out. Now, a funny thing happened because 
we had friendly competitors that had a lot of fun, and they would ask us if we could help them with the bookkeeping because it was kind of a chore. I said, yeah, I've got somebody in the office, so we can help you out. We'll do it for a few bucks. We're friendly competitors. I'm not going to take you into business. And then we started actually doing some bookkeeping for contractors about 1992, 93, getting pretty heavy, 94, and just a few contractors here and there. And then we actually opened a business, which is now fast, easy accounting. And as it turned out, in about in the year 2000 exactly, we sold our last business. It was a small plumbing mechanical, you had 27 employees and seven trucks. But here's the key. We sold the business, and when you sell a business, Tommy, you know this more than anybody else. Nobody wants your friggin' equipment. They don't care about your, your trucks. The, the business name may have some some value. What they're buying is an income stream, and we had a bunch of what's called service contracts. So we had service contracts with a lot of restaurants in uh, Summers County and some in King County that we would set a crew in every so often to go in and clean the drains, fix the faucets on a service contract arrangement. And so when we had slow times, I could send a crew out to do drain cleaning and, and maintenance work. We also had service contracts for residential and some apartment complexes and condos. So that's what we actually sold was that renewable income coming in. So in 2000, we bought the motor home, you know, the RV, and we toured the country. Sure, and I did. Had a lot of fun. And we had a few contractors who were doing some book work for it. And I had a person in the little office. Life was good. We came back, and about six months later, Sherry said, I love you, honey. You're wonderful. You're fantastic. But please get the hell out of the house. You drive me crazy. And so I got more involved in, in the business. And in about 2004, we decided that we love contractors. Now, I have a ton of randalisms. I call them randalisms. And one of my randalisms is that the four types of contractors described earlier, the dog and pickup truck, salt of the Europe professional enterprise, and the randomism, and this is an opinion, Tommy, not a fact, strictly an opinion, okay? Got well, it. My opinion, this is all it is, my opinion is that the earth, sky, sun, heavens, stars were all put together by a builder. That builder, in my opinion, had a son. His son was a carpenter. And therefore, my opinion is anybody who is in construction has royal lineage. And I have a lot of respect and a lot of love for anybody in construction. That's just who I am. That's a little hand there. I'm a big fan. One of my favorite books is The Basic Constructions Before Leaving Earth. So as it turned out, I discovered I love contractors. In 2004, we went through and we farmed out anybody who wasn't a contractor. I said, you need to you know, go someplace else. And I, we found our places for their homes. And so since 2004, we have just focused on contractors. And my favorite contractors, bless their hearts, the brand new startup. I get a big kick out of new startup people. They're great, okay? They've got lots of great ideas. They've got lots of them, vigor, and vitality. And I think it was, there's a, an author, um, I remember his name off the top of the head. He wrote several books. And he talked about entrepreneurial seizure. So in any event, we work with a lot of startup contractors. We work with a lot of trade contractors, journal contractors, handyman, home builders, uh, land developers, and we really focus on startup to $10 million. And we use a program called QuickBooks. A lot of people are familiar with that. There's two flavors of QuickBooks. There's a QuickBooks desktop, which is great for construction, has all the whistles and bells you need to get all your parts, KPIs, work in process, retention, that sort of thing. There's another piece of QuickBooks called QuickBooks Online, which I think QuickBooks Online is great if you have a lemonade stand. It's garbage, this is an opinion, it's just not worthwhile if you have a large business doing anything over 100,000 a year in construction. It just doesn't work. So we use QuickBooks and we have a, an Intuit approved commercial host, which means the QuickBooks desktop rests on a server in California, we're here in Washington State, and anybody can access their QuickBooks desktop from anywhere in the world and it looks just like it's on their, their desktop. It's very easy to work with. So we use QuickBooks. We also use a program called Zero, which is X-E-R-O. We just started using that about three months ago. We've got 40 clients on that right now. So I like Zero and QuickBooks. Zero is kind of the competitor to QuickBooks Online, but it actually works, especially in construction. So that's kind of the short story in a long-winded way. 
<laughs> well, you know what? I love the background because it really gives insight to where you came from, where you're going, where you are today. I got a lot out of some of the talks we had beforehand, especially, you know, the fact is that you knew Ron when he started QuickBooks, which is very interesting. It's a huge deal, 1991. QuickBooks is still a good program. And I think the biggest thing I see people fail, and this is coming from my CPA, who, by the way, used to have hundreds of clients. Now he's got like seven and I'm his by far smallest client. And we're going to, oh, no. I'm the smallest client and he's going to do, you know, I'm going to do close to 40 million. So that's a good thing because he chose me because we get along very well and he wants to help me. I'm like his little protege or something. So his apprentice. <laughs> Excellent. But you know, he, he said, Tommy, there's two main areas I see companies fail as they're growing. He said, number one is you've got to keep current on your city and state and federal taxes. He goes, you cannot put this off. You cannot delay it. You cannot be late. Don't make payments. Just make sure you got that. Put that away. Pay that stuff. And he said, number two is inventory. When you start expanding the multiple states, I see people getting robbed blind. They have no inventory controls. And, uh, you know, I think some of these guys out there listening are probably not having huge issues with that. And they say, it's fine. I keep an eye on this stuff myself. But you know, if you're going to be that guy that does all the inventory, pays all the taxes, tunes up all the trucks, answers all the phone calls, you're not really, you know, this podcast might not make sense to you because we're really trying to figure out ways to help you grow and help you work on the business and hopefully delegate the majority of the stuff that you don't like. So what is your experience been since you've worked with a lot of contractors, especially, you know, under 15 trucks? Where do you see them go wrong a lot of the time? And where's the biggest room for improvement of the people that are listening out there? Well, Tommy, I totally agree with your CPA, 100%. We say the same thing, pay your taxes. I've got an article on my website which describes what it costs and don't steal the government hates competition. Generally speaking, if a person, if a contractor doesn't pay their taxes and if you do the analysis, the present value future dollar and all the interest rates involved and penalties and interest, it runs about 300% is what they're going to be paying in interest. So paying the taxes is number one. I totally completely agree. Now, the other thing that I've seen a lot, and I worked, you're right, I worked with a lot of contractors, and it, it breaks my heart because, and I also agree in inventory, we can cover that just a quick second, but if there's one area that your listeners, if you're doing your brand new startup, if you're doing 100 million a year, the one thing that I have seen that has changed lives as far as their business is concerned is, is real simple. They're called the KPIs, the Key Performance Indicators. Now, that's the key, performance, the key performance indicators are huge. And depending on who you talk to, I think you're pretty skilled in that. They can get very deep and very involved. I put together what I call the five at five for five several years ago. And they can be, in QuickBooks, really simple. The number one in a report is called cash. So put an icon on your icon bar on QuickBooks and you press that icon. It tells you immediately what your cash is and all the investments and the savings and the money market accounts, checking accounts, because here's the randalism. Cash is a fact. Profit is an opinion. So cash is number one. Number two is ARs, accounts receivable. Okay. And that's really critical. Have a good handle on the accounts receivable. And rule of thumb is the very successful contractors I've worked with have very little accounts receivable. We did over you know, a million, five, two million with our construction companies. And I think at one point I woke up with a cold sweat. I was almost, you know, I slept like, I usually sleep like a baby at the time. Wake up crying every two hours because all of a sudden I realized I've got 15,000 receivables. Okay. I just cold sweat. So, Accounts receivable is a real problem. Don't keep a lot of ARs and have that report on your icon bar. Number three is the accounts payable. Now, I wrote a whole article and there's a way to make money in accounts payable. You can make 36% interest on your accounts payable if you know how to do it right. But keep your accounts payable low. Uh, keep them paid. If you have an opportunity for a 2% discount, you pay by the 10th, take it. Because 2 cent pay by the 10th, what they're really telling you is that you can borrow our money for 20 days and we'll charge you 2%. Well, 20 days into a 360-day year interest year period is 18 periods. 
18 periods at 2% is 36% interest. So keep your payables low. Number three is the profit and loss. Watch the profit and loss and on the right hand side of the profit and loss report, have all the percentages and you'll get to know the percentages. And there's all kinds of places to understand where you're at in your area, like your garage or installation. So there's probably some place on the Rob Morris Associates or RMA that you can pull the percentages and know where you're at. Number five is the balance sheet. And I got a randomism of the balance sheet. It's called the three O's. The first O is what you own, those are your assets. The second O is what do you owe everybody? Those are the, the liabilities. The third O is what's left over. That's the equity. Now, really simple. I'm going to say if a, a lot of contractors, for some reason, and I'm just as guilty, we love these 110 pickup trucks. Could be a Ford or Chevy or Dodge, it doesn't matter. But let's say if a person has a brand new F-350 pickup truck and they go skiing in the mountains. And at the end of the day of skiing, the truck is just covered with snow. All they can see is the front foot and a half, the grill and a little bit of the hood. They know that's their truck because they've seen it so many times. It's in the part of the brain called reticular activation device, we recognize patterns. We can see that, oh, that's my truck. I don't know what it is. And just start checking up drive away. Well, the five KPIs I just described, if they look at those five KPIs at 5 p.m. for five minutes, Five at five or five. They can look at them at eight o'clock in the morning. It doesn't matter. But if they look at those five KPIs on a regular basis, this is a game changer because the reticular activation device will begin to see patterns and they'll say, hey, something's wrong here. And what it is, all of a sudden, the labor cost is going up a little bit or the material cost took a spike. And this is how a lot of my smaller contractors under 10 million, I say, watch that material cost. In your industry, for example, we'll say it should be 12%. All of a sudden, it goes to 14 or 16% of the gross sales. Okay? My next question is not if, but who is stealing inventory. So one of the simple ways that we use to control inventory is we watch that material cost. Now, inventory is an asset, but it, when it's used, it becomes a, an expense for cost gets sold. So if we watch that, those various numbers... These are fantastic. And just a quick segue, we do put these KPIs in for free if people want them. But um, that five at five is probably the most important. And that's pretty basic. But I've used that same five or five. I worked a good contract a couple of years ago. And they did like, so like 20 million a year. They didn't have the five at five. And I put the five at five on their icon bar. And we talked several times. We still do some consulting work. And the person said, this is ridiculous. He said, when you said that first five at five, I rolled my eyes up, had a M M E R major eye roll. And I thought it was stupid. But now I look at it every day. I look at that darn thing and it I learn so much because now you're triggered to your activation device what to look for. So I would say the CPA is right. Tax is most important. Keep those things paid. Number two is at five at five, and that will do I mean, I'm only touching the surface. But that 5 at 5 is so huge, okay, because it tells you all kinds of information. And if you know what to look for, then it just starts speaking to you. And the numbers will start reaching out, not literally, but metaphorically. They'll reach out in a way with their hand. They'll say, hey, look at me. Look at me. My, my cost is kind of high. And one of the other costs we look at in a 5 at 5, we do an analysis on what does it cost per mile to operate a vehicle. And I had one, had one contractor, and this was about 10, 15 years ago. And I said, you know, one of your trucks has a high cost per mile to operate. And he said, well, yeah, it does. I said, no, I told you before about getting GPS. This is years ago. It was more expensive. He said, yeah, I can't afford it. I said, you can't afford it not to. Okay, fine. Right, well, shut up. I'll put the GPS on. What's the GPS on? Call me up a few days later on the weekend. and says, hey, I'm in Seattle. Guess where my truck is? I said, um, Portland? He said, no, it's Wakant. I said, oh, my gosh. Now, how do you know that? Because he was looking at the KPIs. And some guy had taken the truck and was going to Spokane like once or twice a month to visit his family or something and using the company rig. Um, so those numbers are very important. I think, Randall, the hard part, and this is where I believe the consulting actually comes into play is – it sounds really nice to get all these things. It's just 
it's kind of like setting everything up in the perfect way because the setup is everything. And I just, mm -hmm. I talk to people all the time and the data is only as good as the people entering the data and the accuracy of the data. So you can look, what I've learned is that people can make you see any number you want to see. The only number they can make you see, and trust me, accountants, I know accountants that could hide a needle in a haystack. So they can mm -hmm. say, yeah, there's a bunch of checks out there right now where there's not a lot of checks out there. So you got more cash to the bank. So I think it's easier said than done, but to get to that process. Now I have a whole different amount of KPIs that have to do with call booking rate, average time on job, average ticket, the average cost of goods sold per ticket. You know, there's so many more that I look at that are different, but they go all up to your stuff, which is really what you should be focused on. And then if you've got a problem, dive into mine. But you know, that's the hard part, I think, is getting the data that you can rely on, you know? That is so true. Oh, you are so right. And it's, it's funny because that brings me to the next point. Is like I said, I started using QuickBooks in 1991, and I love QuickBooks. In about 93, I, I told Shuri, my wife, I said, you know what, I'm going to take the afternoon off, uh, hold my calls, I'm going to take the afternoon off, because I don't like the way QuickBooks sets up their chart accounts and their item lists, and their entire setup. And I'm going to set up what I'm going to call a contractor template, and it's going to work because it's going to have all that setup stuff you're talking about. Well, that started in 1993. This is now 2018, and I get an, an intern in every so often, and we are still updating that template. We now have a template designed for handyman, for trade contractors, builders, developers, you name it. And you're right, because that template we use is set up in such a way that we can take any contractor, merge our template into it, and it gives them a whole new perspective. Now, our template is based on construction accounting, and even more importantly, for those who understand it, it also follows the rules of what's called GAAP. And GAAP is accepted of the accounting principles. Yep, yep. A big, <laughs> a big white building in New York City that we all um, salute at noon. And so it follows the GAAP. And then what happens, there's something called the, the RMA, or Robert Marsh Associates, and that's the same company that the banks all use to get to do loans and, and lines of credit and this sort of thing. So when a person, when a contractor takes their profit and loss and balance sheet into the banker, the banker looks at it and kind of smiles and nods their head and says, oh, this is interesting. This is good. Thank you very much. Once the contractor leaves, all they do is plug it into a piece of software. It used to be a big yellow page book. A piece of software, and that software tells them whether they're lying, telling the truth, whatever it is. And the closer that we can keep it to the RMA that the banks want and gap with this template to set up, you're absolutely right. Now things start to gel and you, you're 100% right. And I encourage this for all contractors and again, under 10 million, especially under 5 million, for goodness sakes, outsource the daily data entry, bookkeeping, accounting, payroll, to people like us or somebody else, it doesn't matter because we do this all the time. And this is the reason we don't do anything more than 10 million because when it kind of gets to like that 10 million mark or getting close, I encourage them, let's go find somebody who can do it all in house and we can train them or you can get training elsewhere. Beyond 10 million, get it all in house. Under 5 million for sure, outsource it and get it set up correctly and get the data in correctly. And I hear this frequently, gee, I can't afford to. On the other hand, we've had a lot of contractors who've done it. And three years later, they say, my gosh, I'm, I'm making, I had one guy, this is kind of funny. The guy who was uh, had a service repair business for like 30 years. And he had one truck and he didn't make any money to speak of. He worked with us for about three or four years, consulting. And he took over his bookkeeping and set it all up, so he described and then one day he comes in, he is madder than hops. I mean, he's ready for a fist fight. He's making a C streak. I said, what's the problem, Mr. X? He said, you SOB, do you know that I paid more money in income tax last year than I made before I ever came to talk to you? I said, you need to speak up. I can't hear you over the purr of your Escalade. <laughs> yeah. I said, and by the way, how was your last vacation in Hawaii? Uh, yeah. Long story short, he kind of settled down. Anyway, he sold his business because he had a lot of service contracts. He sold his business and bought, this is before the big increase in pricing. He bought five rental houses and now he's retired and life is good. Simple as that. So you're right. The, the setup is important. 
and the data entry is important. What we usually start with is the five KPIs. Now, I start with five KPIs because then I can say, okay, here, we need to look at this, we need to clean this up, so on and so forth. Are you familiar with how, when the pilgrims first arrived, how they were able to have fresh pork and, and meat? They had to trap wild boars. Now, I was not there, but my kids think I was. My understanding is that what happened, I, I think some of the Native Americans, this is what the story I read was true or not, I understand some of the Native Americans said, here's what you do. They put a little handful of grain. They picked a, a clearing, maybe you know, 10, 15 feet clearing in the woods. Yep. Where it was, they put a, a pile of grain and they put a, a stick there next to the grain. Then the next day, the grain goes away. They put another little pile of grain and put another stick. Over the course of time, they would build a trap. The wild boar was so interested in coming in and getting that grain, he didn't really pay attention to the fact that the trap was being built. And the very last time they pulled the lever, the trap fell, the pig was captured, and then they come back later and, and find the you know, fresh pig. So what I do with the five KPIs is that wild boar, if we put our finger on the back of our skull and we feel a little bump there about the size of an almond, that's called the amygdala. And the amygdala is also known as a lizard brain. And everything that comes into our five senses goes to the amygdala. And the amygdala has one function and function only. It's called fight or flight. I have some information coming in. There's someone coming, walking toward me on the sidewalk. Is that person friendly or unfriendly? Should I go into a fight mode or a flight mode? It happens, everything happens instantaneously. And so that wild boar is fight or flight. So you're right. There's a lot more to the KPIs, and there's a lot more to set up this sort of thing. So what I do is I take that little that pig, and I give it a little bit of grain, and I say, hey, let's look at these five KPIs. <laughs> and then later on, hey, you know what would be interesting? Let's take a peek at the inventory question. There's all kinds of ways to track your inventory. And let's take a look at other things. And I just keep building it until after a while, I have trapped the amygdala. And the amygdala now lets information go to the seat of judgment and people can make intelligent decisions. And that's when they all of a sudden realize, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm making money. Life is great. I love that concept. I think there's a lot to be said here. When you could identify the data and it's correct, and it's just, it's like anything else. What do you do when you work out? You measure your arms, your legs, your body fat, you get on the scale, and you look at how your body changes over time. So all mm -hmm. very, very important things. What I'd like to do too is uh, possibly get some of these resources on the page on the Home Service Expert that your podcast is going to be on because I think as much as they could get about you and then maybe have a little form that goes to you if, if they want to get some of your advice and I'm going to go into a lot more of how they're going to get more of you later here at the end of this. But one of the things I was going to ask you too, is we talked about the universal common and Oh, real quick. I had one more thing. Sure. So AR, I just looked up something where we were on about AR and, and the probability of collecting when the invoice is due on the due date is hundred percent after 90 days. This isn't universal, but this is a chart I'm looking at comes out to about 78% after six months it's roughly around uh, uh, 60%. And then it goes after 12 months, roughly between 40%. And then after 24 months, you're, you're right around 20%. So I, I believe collecting the money, and that's why banks love my business because we collect on the day of service most of the time, unless it's a home warranty company. We always get that. So AR is a huge thing. Uh, but I want to dive into the universal common denominator of what we talked about before we jumped on the podcast, because I think it's important that people understand you say it's easy to get from one to three and three to 10, but personally, most people struggle to get to that point to where they say, I'm going to trust somebody other than me, other than my wife and kids and family. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that universal common denominator. Okay. There's all kinds of universal common denominators. I've used a variety of them. I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples of what a universal common denominator is. One would be, let's take a concrete contractor. A concrete contractor, the universal common denominator is cubic yards of concrete. Now, there are dozens, if not hundreds of different mixes of concrete. And I've been through this process with a lot of concrete contractors, and I finally get to understand if we just take cubic yards and say, how many cubic yards of concrete 
are you able to produce with one man hour? Or how many man hours produce a cubic yard of concrete? And it's really simple. So we go at the end of the year and we say, you poured a thousand yards of concrete for the year. You had 10 employees. The, you spent a hundred hours. So do the math, it's pretty simple. It's, that's a real simple equation. If it's a framing contractor, we use board feet of lumber. And I hear this all the time. Well, yeah, Randall, but you know, the, uh, the, the walls go up a lot quicker than the ceilings. I said, that's fine, but we just need a UCD. So if we can break any contractor down to what is the universal common denominator? In plumbing, it's foot of pipe. The matter what size it is, it's feet of pipe. If it's uh, electrical, it's called rope, or they bend pipe and pull wire. So rope is um, it's wire. So there's all kinds of universal common denominators for different trades. Now, there is one that I have discovered and did a lot of research on, and I use it all the time with my contractors. And it's universal. It's across all contractors. It is employees, staff. So... The universal common denominator is how many employees they have, and then we can do some calculations on that. But I want to go back to answer your question about that contractor who starts out and he, he or she, I hear this all the time, I can't find good people. There's a cesspool of things flowing in a cesspool that are plumbers, electricians, uh, drywallers, carpenters, garage door installers, you name it, and they're all terrible, Okay. There is a, a wonderful author, and his name is uh, Dr. W. Edward Deming. Have you heard of Deming Bench? He probably. Yeah, I have. Okay. I love Deming. He's fantastic. I have a PMP, my dissertation is on Deming. And I want to address that question about people really briefly. There is a country in this world that, if that country were compressed, and all the landmass were just, you know, you just took it in your hand, just compressed it into one little square or rectangle like on a globe, that country would fit inside the borders of the state of Montana. That country is about the third or fourth largest powerhouse in the world. That country was almost bombed into the Stone Age in World War II. It's Japan. We dropped two nukes on that country. Japan, before the nukes were dropped, they were pretty arrogant. They knew everything about everything. Once they had the nukes dropped on them, they were bound to stone age. They had nothing to lose. And so the U.S. sent some people to help rebuild Japan. And one of the problems they had was they, MacArthur couldn't make a call across Tokyo. So MacArthur got a hold of and brought Dr. Shuhart in, who's a communications expert. Shuhart came and took a look at it and said, you don't have a communications problem. You have a systems problem. And so they brought in Dr. W. Edward Deming. And Deming comes in and takes a look at the situation and said, well, you know what? I can do for Japan what I did for the U.S. Agricultural Department, you know, in the 20s and 30s. He said, it's a systems problem. And so Deming began to preach the, the concept of quality. And I love Deming's definition of quality. It's a predictable result. And so he identified a couple of the Japanese industries and said, you'd manufacture you know, like scooters and, and bicycles. And half the bicycles you manufacture fail in the first year. You have achieved quality if it's a predictable result. Now all we got to do is go through and figure out how to make it down to, make it up to 51% and 60 and so on and so forth. And how we do that is we focus on the process, the system, not the people. And Deming was a statistician. He said that 97% of all problems rest at the feet of management because management decides where the, where the building is going to be, what kind of the in, incoming stock is, and the tools and equipment. 3% of the problems are people problems. And so everything is about the system, the process, and so on and so forth. So now what we've done in our broad businesses is I focus on the process and the system. I don't care whose fault it is because fault is worthless. All I care about is What's the process? So the contractor who's by himself and he says, I can't hire anybody because they're all stupid. Well, bless your heart. I understand. I truly understand. But let's take a step back and let's say, do the people you hire, are you hiring a lot of mentalists who can read your mind? I can't read minds. So what if we were to document our process? 
That's the key. So the people that survey themselves and they stay with themselves, they're simply mentalists. I live on my own head and everything in my head is perfect. And if you don't think like I think, then you're no good. But then if we start to document just a little bit, we can go to that at three employees. Now, going from one employee to three employees is not that difficult because they can communicate by holding one by the throat in each hand and eyeball the third one, and they can do what I call over the campfire. The key is to do go to one to three is if they start to write things down and document the process, life is good. To go from three to ten requires an enormous amount of documentation. It requires some operations manuals. Does this make sense? I'm obsessed with manuals. I got to tell you real quick, I Mm -hmm. wrote with this guy named Al Levy, and um, he helped us put some really important manuals with processes together, and it's the 80-20 rule. Get 80% of it documented. You don't have to worry about the crazy stuff. Don't document every single scenario because you want people to go to the manual for their position and understand what's good and bad or what's running. But if you look at any successful franchise that's been able to scale, it's all about the processes and people always go, well, don't you believe in the people? And I believe, and I say, I believe one thing, the process dictate the people that I get, the way I interview them, the way I find them, the way I check their history, the way I background check them. So the people come from a process and I've absolutely, I believe in people, but the process is what dictates everything. And I've, I just grabbed a couple of books off my shelf. The Toyota Way by Jeffrey Liker. Mm, talks about, yes. You know, double or triple the speed of any business process. Build quality in the workplace systems. Eliminate waste. Turn employees into control, quality control inspectors. And it talks about lean. And it literally, the two-second lean by Paul Akers. I buy this book for everybody, all my managers that work here because we're a lean company and we're always thinking about how to get more efficient, how to develop a better process, how to get rid of waste, how to make employees happy, how to create a better culture. And it's all about Toyota and it's all about Japan. And it's funny that you brought up Dr. Deming because that actually is the root of all this stuff. So Mm -hmm. interesting stuff. You brought me back to the basics here. (laughs) That is so true. Well, now here's a, we should delve into the expansion and contraction isoquant, which we're starting going to right now. So the expansion of the isoquant is like a stair of steps. So let's visualize our minds. You know, we have like, a, like 10 stairs. And they're concrete stairs, and they go up 10 stairs. And there's a platform or a plateau. Then that plateau goes for a period of time, and then there's 10 steps that go down on either side, like then the zero. Well, that first step in the expansion of the isoquant is I start a business. I'm a handyman, I'm, I'm a plumber, I'm a contractor, I'm, a, I'm gonna be a home builder, whatever I am. So that's the first step. They take that step and they become a contractor. The next expansion I sequant is they hired an employee and they get to three employees. Now to do that, they have to have some type of process somewhere. It may be rudimentary, but it's something. Now what a lot of contractors, I see this all the time, they say, Randall, I can't get beyond three. You know, four and five would be nice. I just can't because I can't find people. And that's, Tommy, that's where I say, let's take a peek. Show me your operations manual. Show me your checklist for installing concrete. Show me your checklist for installing a garage door. Show me a checklist for roughing in a two-story, three-bath, two-bedroom, uh, four-bedroom house for electrical. Well, we don't have one of those. Oh, no problem. Let's put one together. And that's painful. But if they'll put it together they can go from three to 10 fairly easily. Now, there's a, another randomism I use. This is very important if people listen to this. The people that got you where you are today are not necessarily the people who are gonna take you to where you're going tomorrow. Very, very important. I hate to say it, but I agree. I mean, there's certain players that work for me that can, but what's very difficult is you've got what the people that wear a lot of hats and they're good at it and they like it and they're firemen and they're good firemen and they're good Mm -hmm. at problem solving. But then you get the next caliber of of a manager that says, I'm not going to take care of everything. I'm going to follow the manual. I'm going to adhere by the manual. I'm going to use steps of delegation and steps of corrective action if it's not followed. And instead of giving people the answer, I'm going to make it easily available to find and continue to lead them to that so they don't become reliant on me. And 
the next caliber up from that is more, it's all systematic processes. And I hate to say it, but the old cliche, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. It's hard to take somebody that learned a certain way and can mature within the company five years later and go from where you were at 3 million to 50 million. And, and then they go, well, it doesn't really, it's not what it, what happened to what it used to be. Right. And I'm like, look, it's changed. It's evolutionized. It's different. This is a new millennium. We, we communicate differently. Everything's different. You're right. We got to roll with the punches if you embrace. So I think a lot of that too, Randall, is, is teaching the people early on that you better embrace change or you're not going to have a position here within the next year. Oh, oh, Tommy, you're so right. You are so right. And, and one of the things that we do, I love Amazon. I'm just a you know, big fan of Amazon. And so every so often, you know, there's a good book that comes out on Amazon, like The Gift, Good to Great, you know, all, all kinds of books. And who moved my cheese? So, the Home Service Millionaire. Will be home available. Service Millionaire, yes. In three months. <laughs> That's my book. <laughs> there you go. I love it. The Home Service Millionaire in three months. I love it. That'd be a great book, too. <laughs> so what we do, and what I recommend my clients, I say readers are leaders. Okay? Your mind is, if you please, it's a little bit like a body of water. If you don't put fresh water in, it becomes a swamp. So we go to Amazon so often and, and, and we'll buy, you know, a bunch of books for our, our staff. We'll pass them out to the staff. And then I wait and listen and hear because I know who's reading those books because they'll comment on them. We eat lunch together. We provide lunch. We pay for people to eat lunch and so on and so forth. And in, it's a working lunch. We each have different things we're at and what our afternoon schedules is and what issues are involved. And when someone brings up, hey, you know, I was just reading in The Home Service Millionaire in three months, and Tommy said, fill in the blank, I know I've got a leader. So this is one of the keys that I, I tell my clients as well. Your staff will not necessarily buy a book, but go ahead and spend a, a 10 bucks a piece and buy a book, pass it out, and then wait to see who comments on the book, because those are the people who are going to take you to that next level. But it's, you're right, it's really important because going from 3 to 10 is a little tough. But when you go from 10 to like 15, if you have a bookkeeper, fire them because the bookkeeper will be overwhelmed. They don't understand what's going to take place with the additional transactions involved. And they get a little concerned and the accounting is out of control and they don't know what to do. So again, 50 to 100, same thing. If you've got to grow your seed level, your corporate level, or you need to replace them. And that is the, the area. I call that the death valley between 10 and 50 mm -hmm. because a lot of contractors, God bless them. I love them. They're fantastic. A lot of contractors will not change people. And I have a randalism. You can't change people. You change people. So you can't take somebody who's with you at 10 and go to 50 unless they grow internally. And the best way to grow internally that I have found is, you know, it's kind of a fact, Tommy, if a person were to say, hang around with attorneys for four years, every day you hang around attorneys and you talk to attorneys and you, you do it, you read law books and you become familiar. It's called law school, you become a lawyer. Same thing for a dentist or a doctor. Okay. So I tell my clients, I say, where are you at today? Because this is very personal, and you can, people listen to this podcast and do it internally. I wouldn't charge any of your friends. Make a list of the six people you spend the most time with. Guesstimate what their annual income is and guesstimate what you think their net worth is. And let's say the six people that a person listens to this podcast, the six people they spend time with are making 100000 a year. That's 600000 And each one of those people have a net worth, they have a house, maybe some investments, and their net worth is 100000 each. Well, divide 600000 income by six, and your income is within 20% of that. It's either eighty or 120000 Your equity, your net worth is between eighty and 120000 So the best way to increase your income and your thinking and your net worth is spend time with people who are very successful. I spend a lot of time with millionaires and billionaires, and I love them. And I have a lot of conversations with these people on a regular basis, and they're very giving of their time. And it sounds funny. Okay, we're in the high-tech world, which is nothing wrong with that. I have a library in my house. 
And I've got over 5,000 books. I keep adding every so often. And yes, they are books. They are ink on paper. And they are books written about and by very successful people. And so when I read that book, I'm having a conversation with the, you know, the Ray Kroc story. I'm having a conversation with McDonald's. I'm having a conversation with Bill Gates' hard drive. I've never met Bill Gates. But Bill Gates and I have a conversation through his books. Does this make sense? Yeah, what I think a good, easy way of looking at it is you don't need to go out and find a bunch of new friends, although networking and hanging out with people that fly like eagles is a great thing. And you don't mm-hmm. need to definitely give all your old friends up that you grew up with. But by reading and spending 50% of your time reading, whereas instead of going and drinking or maybe going on your bowling league, take some time to read actually gets you to that level. And if you add those people up and consider those part of where you're spending your time, it's a great way to move up your income level and net worth. And also probably your education and the way you talk to people and the way you interact with people. Absolutely. And it's so funny because I've run across a lot. I, I, I have actually had the opportunity to associate with people who are billionaires and millionaires. One that comes to the top of the mind is, is a guy by the name of uh, Jay Abraham. And he put together a marketing seminar. I've done one in quite a while. Also, What's uh, his name? Uh, Jay Abraham. Okay. He's from the 70s and 80s. He's a marketing guru. The guy's a billionaire. He's phenomenal. He's a little rough around the edges. There's also a guy, Dan Kennedy. I know Dan Kennedy. I've got all of his books. No BS about marketing or oh, marketing yeah. all that. Now, what's interesting, um, uh, you probably have too. I've been to uh, seminars for both those guys. They're very, very expensive. So I've had the opportunity to be in the same room with these guys, and they are absolutely phenomenal. Hard as nails. And Dan Kennedy, he's just very blunt, doesn't pull any punches. And Dan Kennedy is very strong. He says, look, if you don't read at least a book a month, then you don't belong here. Don't waste my time. And he said, if you're really smart, you read a book a week. And I try to do a book a week. I'm not that great. I think you read one or two books a week yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I download at least five books a week to, on mm-hmm. Audible and I buy at least three books a week, but I don't, if I read the 80, 20 rule in a chapter, I don't have to reread it. Like I talked to you about Parkinson's law. There's a mm-hmm. chapter on that. And if I read through a book, the first two chapters and I'm like, this guy wrote a book to write a book, not to give out any good information. So I'd say about two thirds of the book, I go all the way through one third I get rid of right off the bat because I went through the first three chapters. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I'm very selective if I'm going to make it through. I'll, if I go through the first three chapters and I'm through it, I'm going through the whole book. And uh, I'm obsessed with reading. I, I got to tell you, it's something I pride myself in. And I try, especially when I'm on vacation, is I can go through three books in a day. I mean, mm-hmm. not uncommon. So you're absolutely right that I, I just feel like it changes the whole paradigm of where you're at. And, you know, the biggest thing I'd advise the listeners out there is if you read a book and you like a concept, don't go in and incorporate it in everybody else's life because the first thing they say is, great, what seminar did uh, Randall come from today or what book did he read yesterday? Or (laughs) That's a big mistake that happens. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and, uh, I think it's important to get it into a habit of your own life to where you can prove it out to yourself before you're going to go implement a bunch of new things. So I used to be that guy. Now I go home, I implement it in my private life. I make sure it works in my work life. And then I say, I've been doing this for two months. You guys have been watching me do it. I'm ready to implement it into our system. Love it. Love it. You know, Randall, I got a couple quick questions for you. I'm going to take some of the stuff on here, put it on here that we've had before we, we got started because I think there was some great stuff. One thing I want to just summarize is the valley of death is between one and three, three and 10, 10 and 50, 50 and a hundred and a hundred and 500. So you're at a hundred right now. I'm at 220. I mean, I'm on a race to get to 500 regardless. I think I can get there by the end of next year. Good. The fact is manuals are getting more and more recitable. The people are understanding now that they, we weren't kidding when we implemented this stuff. And I'd love to talk to you about some of this stuff, get the stuff on the website as well. So let me ask you this. I always like to ask the people on the podcast, if there were three books, and I want you to really pay attention to who the audience is. And I'm not saying they're smart, stupid, indifferent. I mean, any book you want, I'm just saying if it could help them in the home service niche or maybe even help them in their lives, that'd be great. 
what would be the top three that you say, these are ones that you, you have to read? Mm. Well, that's a great question because there's a ton of them out there. Let me give that just a little bit of thought. You want to hear mine? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so the E-Myth Revisited is, of course, you know, the Gerber. That one is just a basic fundamental book that I think it has great story and it makes sense. It's about the lady who has the pie business and the, or the cake. And so that is the fundamental, the E-Myth. And then the next book is The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. Absolutely incredible. The 12 concepts he applies there. And then I always love to give people profit first. Now that's mm-hmm. book that I recently read that I highly recommend. And then one last book is, I, like I said, I give everybody is The Two Second Lean. It explains how to be lean within a company and the processes that you can develop. So those are ones that I just give everybody that comes and works for me. And I, I, I love them. But uh, yeah, you know, from good to great, I, I love those books. They're how, built to last. You name it, I think... If I went through the books just on my shelf here, I probably got Raving Fans. I've got some Seth Goodwin books. I got Phil Knight Shoe Dogs. I've got so many great books at Toyota Way. There's Launch, Double Double, Power Questions. <laughs> I mean, who is a great book about hiring employees? But yeah, well, you know, just give me your top book if you don't know off the top of your head. Well, I'll give you the three. Um, the first one I did cross my mind, of course, was The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yep. And Michael Gerber wrote three. I think it's The E-Myth, E-Myth Revisited, The E-Myth Contractor. Yep. So all the Michael Gerber stuff is really good, The E-Myth, because it's, it's a real paradigm shift. Here's what happens. In, in psychology, we have a phrase that's called, we all have a state of mind or state of being. And so what needs to take place is you need to frozen in a state of being. So you need to unfreeze, change state, refreeze. So I like E-Myth because it really brings it down to here are some problems, here are some results. And he talks about processes a lot. The second book that this is more for the advanced class, it's called Out of the Crisis by Dr. W. Edward Deming. Now, a precursor. Deming is not what I would consider to be the most engaging author on earth. It does take a bit. You have to kind of slog through it. But once you read How the Crises and you get to the very end, you kind of look back and say, oh, my gosh, it was fantastic. And How the Crises, I'd like to make a quick note, if you can write this in the show notes or something. There's a, a concept he calls the red bead experiment. It's like um, beads that you run your neck. Yep. Red bead experiment. And it if the listeners, if you ever get a chance to see the red bead experiment in real life, if you're in business at all for, you know, six months or 20 years, and you have a business that's doing hundred thousand or a hundred million. And I saw this in action, the red bead experiment. And there are some people there that are very powerful that had some very large businesses, over a hundred million. And everybody was laughing so hard. Our eyes were watering. It was so funny. And yet it is so true it is a game changer so i think it's actually online on youtube but if you get a chance to see that red bead experiment it is such an eye-opener so e-myth out of the crisis and the third book i really enjoy immensely i'm kind of tied for uh book three so i'm going to say it's between two of them one is the ray Kroc story and that's the story of mcdonald's how ray Kroc developed mcdonald's and any contractor worth their salt has some character building experiences, which means you've been beat up a lot. You've had problems. I, myself, we had a contracting business in the seventies and it didn't work out well. We lost a lot. So I've taken some pretty big hits, but those hits are what help you pick yourself up, dust yourself off and go again. The Ray Kroc story, it is heart wrenching to see what this guy went through. It was astounding. He got, Screwed and tattooed, eight ways to Tuesday. And he still survived. And McDonald's is what it is today with a whole lot of systems in place. So people that read Ray Kroc's story, the contractors read that and said, my God, man, I thought I had a tough time. And I said, buddy, I don't know how this guy did it, but he did it. Okay, the fourth book, which is I'm buying for, you know, Ray Kroc in the fourth book. And this fourth book is a little bit controversial. Some people like it, some people hate it. So if the listener likes it, more power to you. If you hate it, then I understand, okay? It is called Atlas 
shrugged. So think of the Atlas and the weight lifter, and he has the globe on his back. Yep. Shrugging. And that book is by uh, Ayn Rand, A-Y-N, and her last name is R-E-N-D. And she wrote that book in the 1920s. Now, what's interesting is Atlas Shrugged is a very long novel. It's like 1,200 pages. And it is absolutely amazing because I read that book probably once every couple of years. Tommy, it's so bizarre because it was written in the 1920s and it could have been written yesterday. I love it. It is that powerful of a book. No, I love that book. The thing with Atlas Shrugged is the listener. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're somewhat self-reliant, as Emerson talks about, if you believe that you have the power to change yourself. You can't change anything else. You can't change what happens. You can't change what people do. But you have the power over your reactions to what takes place. Then you're going to love Anne Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged. If a person is of the opinion that nothing is my fault, it's all society's fault, the rich should pay for this, the rich should pay for that, then you're going to hate Ayn Rand. That's not me. <laughs> you might like it. I don't know. But uh, I read Atlas Shrugged, and I tell you, I read it back in the a good, a really, really good friend of mine, I have a lot of respect for him, I had recommended Atlas Shrugged. And he said, Randall, he says, I'm gonna like, you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. And I read that book, and I tell you what, I was never the same. I, was, I have not been the same since, because all of a sudden I have a different perspective. See? So it's, it's all about understanding, and, and the, it's a long story, and the protagonist goes through all kinds of problems, but at the very end, it all makes sense. And the idea, that, I don't want to give away, this is not a spoiler alert, but I just want to say that if, if a contractor were to read that book and then reflect on their own lives and all the stuff that's gone well, all the stuff that's gone bad, and then you look back and you say, I have learned so much. I know what to do now. I know where I went wrong. I know I can do improve. And it's a, for me, that's a game changer. So Ray Kroc's story and Atlas Shrugged are the, the, the two, number threes, out of the crisis and E-Myth. And they, they all have one thread in common. The system is the solution. I'll give you a randalism. I teach contractors how to be process dependent, not people dependent. People are good. We need people. And good people love processes, and they can follow processes. You know, for example, uh, you, you invite me to this interview. This is fantastic. You have a process. I got several emails, which is fantastic. It was laid out very clearly. It said, be on the call at this time, log in. You know what, Tommy? I can follow directions. I love your process. <laughs> so there's a theme there. The theme is process. And yeah, once a process is in place, it's amazing what can happen, you know. Money isn't everything, but it sure helps when you know where to shop. So so let me ask you this. It sounds like to me a lot of people out there could use your help. I think that you have a lot of solutions, whether it be consulting to get the systems dialed in, to get those KPIs, or just the basic day-to-day -day to be able to trust their numbers. What's the best way to get in touch with you if they have a question or they're ready to get some help from you? The best way is to go to our website, which is www.fasteasyaccounting.com. So go to the website, take a peek, look around a little bit. On the upper right-hand side, we have four offers. One is called the Bookkeeping 36-Point Review, and that's very popular. We get a lot of people who say, I think my accounting is working okay, but I could use review. Then what happens is that they can, they can uh, click that button fill out the form, and there's a whole simple process to follow. And they can send me a copy of the QuickBooks. I'll do a 36-point review. And in some cases, I'll actually, you know, let's we'll schedule a call like this. I'll get on the phone for half an hour or longer if necessary. And I'll give them some actual information. I'll say, this is what I see that you could do right now in the next few days to improve your business. So that's a real popular thing. Um, I do a lot of that sort of stuff, and then people do that, and they'll call me up back every so often, we'll do some consulting if they need it. The other thing that people do that they enjoy is the outsourced accounting. So we do offer outsourced accounting. And what that is is we take over all the accounting, 
You can do it on QuickBooks or Xero, and they can have access to it on the web, their call. Third thing is called the bookkeeping templates or the DIY. And this happened about two years ago. We kept getting people asking us all the time, hey, Randall, can I just buy the Sharp accounts? No. Hey, Randall, can I just buy the cost codes? No. Hey, can I just buy the work in process uh, accounts and cost codes? No. Can I buy retention? No. And then one day I woke up and I thought, what's, what's one of your randomisms? You'd be right or rich. Pick one. So about two years ago, we started developing what we call the bookkeeping templates. That's a, you can click that little button on our website, and that takes people to the store. We have over 1,500 things in that store, among of which is the outsource accounting. We have the QuickBooks setups and cost codes and zero consulting and training. So the website's the first place to start. They can also give us a call here at the office. Our phone number is 1-800-361-1770. So call, go to the website. And a final thing for people who are interested, I did cover briefly the, the five KPIs on the QuickBooks icon bar. And a lot of people don't know how to do that. If they were to go to the www.fasteasyaccounting.com forward slash podcast dash bonuses and click on that, it'll bring to the page called podcast bonus and they can set an appointment and we will install the KPIs on their QuickBooks desktop. We showed in a video. We charge $99 to do that normally, but people listen to Tommy's podcast, we will do it free, zero, zip, no cost, just for listening. All they do is they scroll down, they book an appointment, they're off to the races, and then we dial in and do that for them. Now, that's all the good news. You ready for the bad news? I'm ready. I'm not much of a salesman. <laughs> so Good. I'm yeah, I, I'm really not. I'm an accountant, okay? So what happens is we get this all the time. People get the KPIs installed, and they're kind of, you know, a little cautious. Okay, you're going to try to tell me somebody something. I get it all installed. It's like, you have any questions? No, I don't. Well, if you do, please give us a call, and it's good talking to you, and bye for now. Click. And then if you call back later, you know, I say, well, I, I thought you were going to tell me something. No, I. we have plenty of clients. I don't need to sell anybody anything. But if you're a contractor, I do want to do what I can. I'll bend over backwards, do anything I can to, to help you become successful if you're a contractor. The other piece of bad news, and I, I got to tell you flat out, we get this occasionally. We just got a call recently from a, I have a PMP, Project Management Professional. So I got a call from a, a project management organization. They're very large. You know, 50, 60 million a year. And they have a client that's doing 25 or $30 million and they're in project management and they need somebody to do their accounting. And I said, well, I could take you on as a client, but here's the problem. I'm very expensive for people like yourself. And if I have a choice between working with a brand new handyman contractor or a brand new trade contractor that just started up and I'm charging him 10 bucks, or working with you, I'm going to charge you 500 an hour, then I've got to go to the handyman because he's more important to me. So that's the bad news. I Anybody like listening to the podcast, if you're not a contractor, I love you. I think you're fantastic. I hope that life works out well for you. If you're not a contractor, please don't call me because <laughs> I'm not going to work with you. And I mean that with love in my heart. Okay, I really do. If you're a contractor, I want to work with you. I love it. Well, listen, I got to tell you, Randall, I do a lot of these and I thoroughly enjoyed your company in general. I think just the way you talk, your stories, the knowledge in your head is just, it's exciting to get a piece of it out. And what I like to do is follow up with you on some of this stuff. I'm going to check out everything on your store, possibly even work with you down the line, because I think there's some interesting things that I, I like to tell my guys, I don't, come up with every sales process and design everything. What I do is I find the best guy and I interview my best guy on a daily basis. If a guy goes from a $200 door sales average or service call average to 900, I call him up and I'll ask him 25 questions. And I say, what changed? What did you start telling yourself? What did you do when you drove there? How did you meant to prepare? Did you sleep more? Did you do this? And I just, I gather this knowledge and it becomes, I almost think I came up with it by the time I'm done with it. Cause I've heard it from so many people and I've kind of just, build my own stuff. So I think this is going to go a long way. And I just wanted to say that you've been amazing. I'll be following up with you. And if you guys want more, we're going to put a lot of 
the links and some of the things that he talked about on the website. So you guys have access to it. And we'll also put a link to his webpage and his store on there. So Randall, once again, it's been a pleasure. Uh, Randall's last name is Dehart, D-E-H-A-R-T. And it's capital D and capital H. And that's the best way if you want to contact him through LinkedIn or something. But uh, is there anything else you wanted to add here at the end? Yeah, I, the only thing I'd like to add at the end is if you're a contractor listening to this podcast, just know that you've got a lot of support. There are a lot of people that, that love you and support you. And we want, we want the best for you if you're a contractor. If you're not a contractor, uh, help you <laughs> well too. If you're a contractor, just know that sometimes contractors, they, they feel alone. You know, it's like they're cowboys and cowgirls. But just know you're not alone. There's a lot of people pulling for you. So Sounds great. Well, thanks, Randall. I'll be in touch. I appreciate your time today. You're welcome, sir. Thanks, Tommy. Have a great day. You too. Bye for now. Hey, guys. I really appreciate you tuning into the podcast. I wanted to let you know that my book is available right now on Amazon. It's called The Home Service Millionaire. That's homeservicemillionaire.com. Just go to the website. It'll show you exactly where and how to buy the book. I poured two years of knowledge into this book and I had 12 contributors, everybody from the COO at Home Advisor to the CEO of Valpac and of course, Ara, the CEO of Service Titan. It tells you how to have the right mindset and become a millionaire and think like a millionaire. It goes into exactly how to turn on lead generation. Have those phones ringing off the hook for the customers that you want to be calling where you can make money and get great reviews. It also goes into simple things like how to attract A players. Listen, if you want a great apple pie, you need to buy good apples and you need to know where to buy those apples. And it also talks about simple things like knowing how to keep the score. You should have your financial check every week. You should know exactly what's coming in and out of your account. You should know when to cut advertising that's not working. And more than anything, you should know how to cut employees that aren't making it for you. Listen, you might have a big heart, but this book is going to show you how to make decisions built on numbers. I hope you pick up the book and I really appreciate everything. I hope you're having a great day. Tune in next week. Thank you.